The focus of our discussion today is going to be on applying psychological strategies to the interview, particularly the interview in the police setting or the police interrogation setting. And the interview is often the cornerstone of offender decision making and prosecution and arguably the most high stakes component of the criminal investigation. And if done correctly, the interview process can identify an appropriate and guilty suspect. However, if poorly implemented, then the suspect can, of course, get away with offences or alternatively, police can engage in coercive practices, creating a false confession and this can result in a wrongful conviction. Now, unstructured interviews are of limited value and conclusions that are drawn from these generally have very low validity, but structured and planned interviews commonly yield valuable information and outcomes. Now, there are two methods that have been developed in the forensic context for interviewing. And firstly, we have the cognitive interview and also the PEACE model, which is a framework for interviewing. Now, we're not going to discuss the read technique that is commonly used in North America because it's largely problematic and coercive. Now, collectively, the cognitive interview and the PEACE model have led to significant improvements in the quality of information that is gained from witnesses and suspects involved in crimes, respectively. Now, the cognitive interview is based on the psychological processes of perception, memory, social dynamics, and communication, and it's been found to increase subject recall by approximately 30 to 50%, and this is around improving memory, recollection, and communication skills in demanding context or demanding situation of recall. And although the cognitive interview has primarily been used for memory retrieval in witnesses and victims, the technique requires the interviewer to develop effective methods of engaging with subjects to elicit that information. Then we have the PEACE model, which was developed at a similar time in the UK to the cognitive interview. Now, the PEACE framework was proposed as a method to implement a consistent and structured approach to police interviewing that could systematically be acquired, applied across policing. The model uses a conversation management style and cognitive interviewing techniques. And the first step is around the planning and preparation of the interview. And this is done by accessing a range of information about the interviewee. And this includes things such as past criminal history, information on current relationships, any known relationship history, acquaintances, employment, and then also developing a working hypothesis about the person's personality or character. Then our next step is engagement and explanation. And this involves building rapport and potentially interacting with the suspect or witness in an unstructured way, which may then provide an opportunity to assess the person's interpersonal skills and behaviours when they're off guard or more relaxed. Then in the account phase, the interview proceeds through substantive questioning and it's again suggested that having prior knowledge of the interviewee is very important as this allows for probing of the account and probing of specific events and information and also narrowing down on inconsistencies that emerge. Finally, we have the closure and evaluation sections of the interview, which involve summarising key details provided during the interview. And following this, the interviewer then reflects on the interaction and particularly focuses on any unusual or concerning interpersonal things that arose or dealings in the interview. And according to Shepard, in addition to the peace steps, Interviewers should be able to display six key skills. And these skills are observation and memory, listening and assertion, active listening and information processing skills, 
appropriate questioning which leads to elicitation of information, probing, initiation and regulation through control and social reinforcement processes and alongside this the interviewer should be able to confront emotions that arise in the interview through reflection and summarising back to the person that's being interviewed what they have expressed. Now Shepard contends that the PEACE framework provides an overarching process to guide interviews However, this forms only the basis for a competent interview. So for an interviewer to be skilled and capable, they must have the following characteristics. Firstly, the ability to detect and identify changes in nonverbal behavior that may be suggestive of evasion or deception. Secondly, the ability to observe changes in emotional state, intent, disposition or attitude. Thirdly, the capacity to form an overall picture of the interview as a whole, so to take an objective view of the interview where essentially you're able to step back and view this as a third party as though you're looking in on the process. Then fourthly, the skills to determine indicators of ambiguity, vagueness or contradiction. So the interviewer needs to be able to monitor for acute changes during an interview above and beyond simply listening to the interviewee's responses and determining whether they fit the crime. So in the absence of appropriate interviewing skills, interviewers are subject to basing decisions on incorrect information such as appearance, prior behavioural history, conversational style and even interpersonal features. And for example, Porter and Tabrink describe this tendency to make judgments about a person based on incorrect information as what is known as dangerous decision theory, where people believe that attributes or features are representative of a person as a whole. And dangerous decision theory has been highlighted as an issue in mock juror decision making with jurors making decisions about a defendant's guilt based on whether they appear to be trustworthy or untrustworthy. And contrary to what many may believe, intuitive judgments about a person's character are generally problematic and flawed with research suggesting that first impressions once formed become solidified with preferential information observed and contra contradictory information or indicators ignored. So without an appropriate understanding of interviewer bias, dangerous decision theory, then areas of susceptibility for manipulation and deceit can certainly arise and interviewers are also then prone to making poor judgments and actually being exploited themselves. And the four competencies that are specified by Shepard suggest that interviewers are not only not only needed to be well practiced in providing and creating a structured interview, but they also need to be skilled in nonverbal behaviour, objectivity, verbal and nonverbal inconsistencies, deception, and identifying emotional states. And in some police settings, officers actually have specific roles of expertise. Some of these are investigative while others are focused on interrogation and interviewing. And at a minimum, without using specialised experts trained in interviewing practices, police should implement formalised and structured processes for conducting an interview. Now, the PEACE model provides a framework to guide police interviews, but Fernaham and Taylor have adapted this to provide more specific context to interviewing. So instead, the authors detail nine steps rather than the five of the PEACE model, suggesting that the following focused areas are essential for the interview. All right, so firstly, we have preparation and planning. So this involves reviewing files, reviewing the offender's history, looking at the objectives for the interview, developing a plan, understanding who the person is that's going to be sitting in front of you, and 
knowing the key elements of the crime scene and the crime scene information. We then move on to our second step, which is the welcome. So this is about when you initially welcome and introduce the suspect or even the witness into the interview as you're going into that situation. It might be walking down the hall with them or it might be as they enter the room and it's these brief two to three minutes, this initial conversation and, and it's about initially establishing rapport with the interviewee, greeting them, spending a few minutes conversing and this is often overlooked, particularly in formal and structured interview settings, but it can assist reducing anxiety for both parties and also setting up that initial engagement. Then we move to our third step, which is explanation. And this is outlining the interview process, what will occur, the aims, the requirements, and supporting the interviewee to control and direct the process of their responses. We then move to the account stage, and the aim here is really to initiate a free report. So it's to allow the interviewee to have control and freedom in speaking, implementing active listening, open questioning, time for pauses, and without interruption. And this provides the opportunity for a sufficient narrative to develop and to also examine verbal and nonverbal indicators. We then go down to some further components of the account stage. So the next stage is filling in the gaps. So once an open report or account has been given, the interviewer should review their notes and gaps in information and remind the interviewee that it's okay to say, I don't know, rather than guessing for a response. So it's about identifying what gaps have emerged. Then we move on to looking at targeted retrieval. And this is about reviewing accounts where necessary and focusing on specific aspects and details that have been discussed, narrowing it down to the core details and the matters where there's evidence that's present and inconsistencies in the interview have been identified. Then we bring the account component of the interview to a close by summarising the information that's been discussed and the outcomes that may arise moving forward. And then lastly, well, our second last step then is our closure, which is about bringing the interview to a close and providing details in relation to any additional questions, methods of contact and next steps. Then lastly, we have the evaluation, which is about analysing the interview, writing up a summary, reviewing the strengths of the interview, the gaps that may still remain, and possible areas of deception and inconsistency, and determining any follow-up follow -up action that's required. Now, along with these nine stages, we need to be aware of the types of questioning or questions that are being used. So essentially, we have four types of questions. Now, these are open-ended, closed-ended, leading, and forced choice. Now, open-ended questions are questions that allow the respondent to talk, such as, what has your day involved so far? Then we have closed questions, such as, can you please tell me your age? Then we have leading questions, such as, you thought she looked pretty, didn't you? Then lastly, we have forced choice questions, which can be used in many ways. So... It might be things such as, do you prefer the colour green or the colour blue? Or did you use a knife or a gun? Now, generally, we need to be careful with leading questions and forced questions. And they need to be used selectively and only when you are narrowing in on a point. Otherwise, it's about sticking to open-ended questions then narrowing down without other forms of questioning. And the key to remember is that the interview is about information gathering rather than seeking confirmation, which can create issues because we're then seeking to confirm our views or opinions about the person. Now, along with these factors, we want to be aware of non-verbal behaviours. 
Now, it's not about making strong inferences from this information, but noticing and considering what these mean. Particularly if the interview is recorded, then this can be then reviewed later and closer consideration can be given to this information. So things to think about include eye contact, facial expressions, gestures, glances, posture, proximity, smell and touch. Now the other final aspect to consider is how to deal with resistance when this arises during the interview. So we've got a set of points that I'll discuss. So firstly, it's about identifying these barriers early in the interaction. So what is it that the person is resistant or defensive to? Identify these things, then park these and come back to these at a later point. Secondly, remember that most defensive people are often insecure or reacting due to some form of sensitivity due to the issue. Thirdly, respond to defensiveness with empathy and warmth. The key is to maintain rapport and to continue the interview. So respond with empathy and interest, such as, what makes this difficult for you? Or, why are you finding this to be upsetting? Then reflect this response back and use this to facilitate further information gathering. Avoid using absolutes such as you always or you never. So don't back the person into a corner or use labels. The only time when we want to back the person into the corner is in the targeted retrieval stage of the interview, but don't do this any earlier. Then we also have things around working to establish a narrative that permits the person to be responsible for their own behavior, particularly looking at developing this towards the end of the interview. So at the start, you may look at slightly agreeing and working with their clear distortions. By the latter stages of the interview, we want to be getting them more to be talking about them, their behavior, their actions from more around that ownership and responsibility point of view. We need to also set limits on behavior that is aggressive and defensive. So try and put boundaries around containing this. And of course, don't play into the defensive individual's demands to explain or justify your questions or justify yourself. They often use this as a technique to validate their position or to elicit information from you. All right, so now we're going to look at a case which in my view, the interview is done extremely well. Now we're going to work through the nine stages of the interviewing and highlight where these arise in the aspects of this interview and show how this is done by the interviewee. Now this is in relation to a suspect that is being interviewed regarding two potential murders. And the first victim or first believed victim is a 37 year old flight attendant and the second victim is a 27 year old female that was working in logistics. All right, so we're going to jump straight into looking at the interview and we're going to look at the first three stages of our, essentially our peace model or the model of how an interview should be conducted using a structured framework. So we're going to look at the preparation, the welcome and the explanation. And this is done incredibly well in this example with the police interviewer really setting up the initial stages of the interview very well. So as you're watching this, I encourage you to take notes, look at how you think there's evidence of preparation and planning, look at how the interviewer welcomes in the suspect and also the explanation that he provides in regard to the interview and the processes that the suspect needs to be aware of. All right. I'm just have a seat here, Russell. The guy I was speaking with on whatever night that was was Russ as well. 
Oh yeah. And took uh, took every number I had. Yeah. Now they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. Right. Glad to see it. I'm um, just gonna move your gloves here. That's a little microphone, just yeah. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh no. Okay. No. Let's get this set up here. Well, I guess the closest to interview by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh yeah. All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, sure. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today. Okay. okay? Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you. Okay. okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a uh, a coffee guy or not, I, but I didn't guy. want to drink yeah. in front of you, so. No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely, are they black? Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. I um, definitely uh, take them out. I'll just start in my room, so I'll probably have it a little bit. Start your what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. Just a piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right, and again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough, mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe everybody with respect. I don't yeah. want to ask you to do the same for me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Um, have you ever been read your rights before? No. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it on TV a whole bunch of times, right. but that's usually the American version. So okay. I'll go over with you briefly, okay? Mm -hmm. um, basically in Canada, uh, as you know, I'm sure, is uh, we all have uh, our rights guaranteed under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right. okay? Now, uh, Russell, just to avoid any confusion, because people do get confused when they're talked to by the police, is mm -hmm. that uh, um, you're obviously not under arrest here today, okay? Yep. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down to the lobby anytime you want, okay? okay? Um, if there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that, uh, that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about, sure. um, you, just, uh, you just let me know, okay? Sure. And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating. Okay, right. um, and essentially what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, yeah. um, there have been four occurrences, that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009, yeah. um, and very briefly, they were up in the uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie France uh, Como um, um, yeah. Yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And uh, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. And um, then, most recently, we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So essentially, when you're looking at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges. All right. Um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first-degree murder, mm -hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm -hmm. uh, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. um, forcible confinement. Okay. And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that clearly when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, all right? Absolutely. And that's why it's important that we uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, mm -hmm. okay? So as I said before, any point today uh, you feel the need, you want to speak to a lawyer, uh, you let me know, and okay. uh, we can take you to a room where you can do that in private, okay? Okay. Um, do you have your own lawyer? I have a realty lawyer, but okay. no, I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> All right. 
Um, if at any point you want to make that call and you don't know who to call, mm -hmm. uh, we have a phone list of lawyers that uh, are available to give you advice free of charge right over the phone. Okay. okay? So again, if at any point today you want to uh, take advantage of that, you just let me know. Sure. Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Okay. A um, couple other uh, fairly simple and straightforward uh, things that uh, you probably understand, but uh, again, we go over them to make sure everybody's clear, mm -hmm. is that uh, you don't have to speak to me today, okay? okay? And the reason for that is because the law considers me to be what we refer to as a person of authority, mm -hmm. okay? Probably similar to what you may be considered to be on the base. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I can be compelled to appear before any judge in the country, basically, to account for what takes place here today between you and I, okay? Sure. And that's the reason why everything's recorded, yep, um, because there can't be any more accurate record than that, right? So, no, understood. Um, and the other thing I want to make sure you understand is that uh, you know you mentioned a second ago about uh, Miss Como um, being one of your uh, work associates. Um, so I don't know what's happened since November um, on the military side of things. Um, but what we want to make people clear on is that uh, if you have been spoken to by any person in authority or any police officer about any of those cases, um, I don't want what they may have said to you to uh, um, make you feel influenced or compelled to say anything to me today, okay? Whatever you might have felt influenced or compelled to say to them earlier, mm -hmm. you don't have to repeat it to me and you don't have to say anything further, okay? okay. But obviously what you do say, you know, for the third time is being yeah. recorded, right? So. Um, understood. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened, but uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well. But the second one was uh, was very close. Yeah. So certainly at the time, the OPP did a door-to-door. Uh, -door. Yeah. yeah. And uh, within a couple of days, probably the same night, so I spoke with a couple of guys then. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm aware of that from mm -hmm. uh, looking at the different cases. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to uh, to talk to you about, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, those four cases are of uh, concern to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there was a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, and then I guess or, I drive past. Uh, yes, I, I would yeah. have to say there is a, a connection. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's why um, I'll be quite frank with you. That's why uh, things kind of um, uh, evolved when uh, the officers talked to you on Thursday night. Okay. Uh, we kind of went from there because uh, when I think you discussed with them the fact that you were a, uh, uh, a colonel yeah. uh, at the base. Oh, I was in uniform at the time, so. Yeah, so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Miss Como um, yeah. was made, um, and I believe you're uh, a door or two down from one of those two uh, incidents uh, I think, in uh, Tweed. Three doors down, yeah. Yeah. Very close, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So uh, those are some of the issues we wanted to discuss with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just getting back to uh, these four incidents that we're talking about. Um, maybe you could just give me a little bit of history as to uh, your arrival in, in the uh, in the base in Trenton. When did you start working there? So we can see that that was set out exceptionally well. He welcomes Russell in, even builds rapport by offering him a coffee. There could be an argument that part of that, yes, definitely was around establishing a rapport. There's also an element where, of course, you'd probably like to get that chewing gum out of his mouth because that's probably also allowing him to feel more settled and comfortable in the situation. He then goes on to establish boundaries and it does this really well by stating, I have a simple rule, I treat everyone with respect. So he's able to make that connection by, first of all, talking about that he's going to be respectful and that part of that is having an equal respectful relationship in turn. Then the interviewer goes on and clearly outlines Russell's rights and he does this in quite a comprehensive manner. He then also helps and provides context around why he has been brought in to be interviewed and that then allows the interview then to get straight into the core information and to then shift on to the account stage of the interview. And of course, the account stage of the interview 
can be a very, very long stage. And this is a process of what we spoke about before with open-ended questions, closed-ended questions. Sometimes it might be forced or leading questions, but it's about providing a long and consecutive narrative that provides all the details. It's primarily the suspect or the subject talking, and then it's narrowing down from that point. So we'll now move in to the account phase of this interview. So if we were to uh, to you know do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, absolutely did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right, because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it? Uh, um, you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in an investigation, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we need to cover off is, uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to, uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch... Uh I prefer Law and Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally. Yes. Okay, so you have an idea of obviously the forensic capabilities, things like that, are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What uh, What do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's what we're going to we're going to ask you to do. Okay. All right. Now we have a process we have to go through to do that. Okay. Um, and for the blood sample, uh, I don't take the blood sample. We have specially trained officers that are trained to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to step out and make sure they're still available. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible. Yeah. Because uh, you know this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the military certainly be of great assistance for, to us, especially mm -hmm. in relation to Ms. Como's investigation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to, to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. So, okay. Um, it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. Now that you've had some time to, I mean, I know we've been throwing a lot of things at you here, but now you've had some time to, to think about things. Um, is there anything uh, that you're concerned about uh, that buckle swab matching in any of those four residences? Um, is there, I guess, let me explain you what I'm getting at here, Russell, okay? Um, this is a significant investigation, as you can, yep, so as you can well imagine. Yep. Um, that, uh, that DNA is going to be uh, significant in our investigation, both, uh, you know, quite possibly to help you, quite possibly to help yes, us. Understood. I don't know yet. I don't know what the result is yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go back to the example I gave you because it's a very similar uh, issue, I think. Um, and you talked about the idea of discretion here. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the idea that, uh, um, you know, you, well, I think hopefully you appreciate the fact of how we approached you here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and essentially, uh, we have no issues with that, okay? Um, we, we talked recently about, you know, the whole idea of any unusual sex acts in your history. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing that can often happen in cases like this is that people um, become concerned about uh, um, things like extramarital affairs, mm -hmm. uh, indiscretions along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of, anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why, if if your DNA is found, it would help us understand why it may be there. Absolutely not. Okay. Can you think of any reason um, why we would find your DNA in any of those residences? No. Let's let's focus on. Well, for instance, uh, I believe. Let me just check the name there. Make sure I've got the right address talking about the house that was just uh, a couple of doors down from you there in, uh, in Tweed. 
couple um, of doors down was the, uh, Lori. I don't know her last name. I don't know. Mazzucati? I don't even know what her last name is, but uh, there's a, the, the woman down the road, three doors down, was, yep. her name is Lori. I don't know her last name. All right, let me just make sure we're on the same page here. Okay. Uh, my understanding is she lived at the 76 Cozy Cove. Yeah, so she would be the one, the second one, uh, the second incident on your on your road there. Yeah. A couple of doors down. Ever been in her house? No. We met her once, I think the first summer um, we were there, so in 04. Okay. And that's what I'm getting at. I, I, again, this is a credibility issue, right? Yeah. Because I don't want to come and see you two weeks from now and say, you know, Russ, uh, yeah. our CSI people in that house. And uh, are you familiar with how C, uh, DNA works? I think broadly, yes. I okay. guess so. Um, one of the challenges we have in 2010 with DNA is it's become so um, precise that um, I guess the best way to explain it is I can think back 15 years ago when I started in, uh, in violent crime investigation. Yeah. Um, for us to get a DNA match, the sample we had to find was, um, you know, probably would have filled half of one of these cups. Okay. You know, because they destroy so much of the, uh, the sample in the, in the testing. Okay. Um, essentially, DNA has become more and more precise to the point where when you and I walked in this room earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, we could have sat down, talked for 30 seconds, yeah. walked out, CSI officer could have come in three, four days from now, yeah. did some swabs here, and he would have found your DNA and my DNA, mm -hmm. and probably a lot of other people's DNA. Sure. Um, a little bit gross to think about, but essentially, uh, you know, as we talk, um, we, you know, a little bit of aspirate comes out of our mouth yeah. no, that uh, that contains our DNA, our blood, or uh, our skin cells contain our DNA, yeah. and that's what I'm getting at. If you were ever in Lori's residence, uh -huh. quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be. Uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? No. Okay. Um, what about the other lady down the road on... Uh, I hadn't even heard that name, so no, I don't I don't actually know who that was. Okay. Have you ever vi visited uh, uh, Marie Franz Como at her residence? No. Okay. All right. Um, so you're quite positive there would be no reason why your DNA would be in any Absolutely. of those three locations. Okay. Um, did you know Jessica Lloyd even in passing for any reason? No, I didn't hear, hear her name until it was on the news. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that uh, is because um, I know you were asked that question on Thursday night, and sometimes what we find, and again, this is one of those situations that can sometimes cause us to get in a lengthy investigation as somebody that mm -hmm. maybe doesn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what can happen sometimes is they, you know, somebody gets stopped by the police like you did, and they, uh, they get asked that question and people when they're stopped by the police they can be nervous okay mm -hmm. um, so they blurt out an answer and then they start driving away and they go oh, why do I do that because the problem is is that once they uh, get asked again then they feel compelled to maintain that answer for fear that if they change their answer yeah. somebody could find it you understand what I'm saying I do okay so I want to make sure that's not happening here I don't care what you said to the officers on Thursday night mm -hmm. last week um, if there's any uh, communication or contact between you and Jessica Lloyd, you've seen her picture, right, around I town? Have. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Ever seen her before? I don't know. I would say I have not. Okay. All right. All right. And you mentioned something about uh, doing some renovations at your, uh, at your property in Tweed there. Um, I think you said something earlier about tearing up carpet. Correct me if I'm wrong. But oh, yeah. Okay. When did all that happen? In 2004 or five. Okay. Any recent uh, renovations? No. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure I'm covering all the bases here. Um, okay. What kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think um, I think they're Toyo. Okay. Do you know the brand name, or sorry, the, uh, I think the make? That is a, um, I don't know. Sorry, the, the make is Toyo. Yeah. I don't know the model. Okay. Let's see. I'll wrap, read this off to you, see if it rings a bell. A 
ever heard of uh, does Toyo Open Country HTS? That sounds make any right. sense? Yeah. Okay. When did you have those tires put on your Pathfinder? Well, it's the second version we've had of them, so uh, I think it might have been this past fall. They replaced other ones we'd had on the same. Okay. Well, Toyo, I can't say that they were the same, exactly the same model, but uh, our dealership here in Ottawa says they're very popular for the Pathfinders. So. Okay. And they were good. They lasted a long time. All right. Um, I've had to. I think you were talking about the the whole idea of the MPs uh, helping us with our investigation mm -hmm. stuff like this. Uh, you have the same system as we do at our headquarters with the swipe cards. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, one of our investigators did is they made a call while I was talking to you there um, because we were trying to work through that week of the uh, the 23rd of November. Okay. Um, 23rd being the Monday, uh, 24th being the Tuesday. Okay. Um, what what they've what they've told us is that, um, and I want to make sure I get this right, is that uh, on the 23rd, uh, your swipe card was being used at the base. Okay. Okay. Uh, on Tuesday, 24th, there was no use of your swipe card. Okay. okay? And then on the uh, the following days, uh, the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, there was what appeared to be average activity of your okay. swipe card in the base. Does that make sense to you? It does. That that says that I was in Ottawa on the Tuesday. Okay. Do you remember where uh, in Ottawa you were? Yeah, I was in Gatineau with, uh, as I said, meeting about the uh, C-17. Okay. Um, now, again, I want to be fair to you here. We're going back two months. Yeah. Um, are you sure that would have been the, uh, the day you were in Ottawa? Well, only because I wasn't at the base. Okay. So I, I can't remember, honestly, that that's the day I had the meeting in Ottawa, but uh, if I wasn't at the base, it was because I was here. Okay. Now, if that is the day you had a meeting in Ottawa, um, do you remember being at the base on the Monday, uh, the 23rd, and swiping your card in and out? Do you remember what you would have done that evening to, to, to get to Ottawa for that meeting? Like, would it be... Uh... I drove to Ottawa in the morning of the day of my meeting, so if it was the Tuesday, then I would have left uh, Tweed. It was a very foggy morning okay. uh, that morning. Uh, I drove in that morning. Okay. So I would not have been at the base uh, the day I was in Ottawa, because the meeting started at 8.30 or something. Okay, so you leave the base, you would have went home to, to your residence in Tweed? Yep. And then you left Tweed in the morning and drove up to your meeting in Ottawa? Yep. Okay. Um, you leave the, the meeting in Ottawa, is a daytime meeting, evening meeting, or do you remember? Uh, yeah, it was a, a daytime meeting, finished, I don't know, mid-afternoon or so. Okay. We had lunch and then uh, finished. I think uh, my wife and I had dinner because she was here for work and then I headed back. So we see that we're very much in the account stage where it's really around information gathering, establishing what facts that can be determined. And it's a mixture between the interviewer asking direct questions and we certainly see a number of direct and closed ended questions during this interview where it's just about getting simple answers in many ways a yes or no response around whether something did or did not occur or factual information around set dates and details and then that at times is followed up by open-ended questions to get more of an account around for example what the movements were in the lead up to these events. So really we're getting a account and a fill in the gaps approach happening during this stage of the interview. Gathering information, further information then is asked to fill in the gaps and it's slowly building the narrative and building the storyline. So what we're going to do now is jump further down the interview, further on in the interview, and start to look at where we get targeted retrieval. So the interviewer has narrowed down on the evidence and the inconsistencies in what has been said by Russell and is now targeting specific questions where there's clear gaps and beginning to narrow that down to look at why that inconsistency is happening and really challenge and confront Russell in the situation. I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay, uh, the, 
trying to be as discreet as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you. It's issues that point at you, okay? And I, wanna, I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house. Mm -hmm on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right, now I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, okay? Okay. All right, that's not to scale. That's The footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch, okay? okay? But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Okay. I'm gonna move this over so you can see what I mean, all right? Because essentially when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're, you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially what we're talking about here is, when, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position, yeah. okay? This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Yeah. Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like, uh, like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare, mm -hmm. so we're going to get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yeah. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is, this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house, and I need to know why. You need to explain it because this is the other problem we're having, Russell. Okay. Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. Okay. So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay. You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. Okay. You and I both know that the unknown offender male DNA on Marie France Como's body is going to be matched to you quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay. This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Science is on call 24 hours a day helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're applying, the investigators now applying for a warrant to search your office. 
Right? These aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to. This is the practical steps in an investigation like this. And Russell. for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works, all right? And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, where's your credibility? Where's your believability? You're just another, uh, and again, don't take this wrong, Okay, but you can see if you step outside this room in your mind and imagine how people are going to view you, okay, if the truth comes out after the clear evidence is presented to you, when you finally go, okay, I'm screwed now, mm -hmm. what are we going to do? Russell. You know there's only one option. What do you what do you what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Because okay? I don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it. Got off on having that label. Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. So what are we going to do? It's 
Jessica somewhere where we can find her easily? Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her, or is this something where we have to go and, and uh, take a walk? Which direction are we heading in here? Russ, maybe maybe this would help. Can you tell me what the issue is you're struggling with? What's the issue you're struggling with? So what am I doing, Russ? I put my best foot forward here for you, bud. I really have. I don't. I don't know what else to do to to make make you understand the impact of what's happening here. Did we talk? I want to um, minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. So how do we do that? Well, we start by telling the truth. Um, is she close to where she lives? I've got maps of that general area. Which town is she near? Why don't we start there? I'm not sure if you give me a map of that um, covers Caligar down to the highway and over to Tweed. I'll show you. Let me see what I got here. I might have something. Is she inside, outside?
<clears throat> All right, so no doubt lots of silence in there, and it does take some time in narrowing that down to really get to the key details, but of course, the silence is also quite powerful, and that can certainly play a role in the targeted retrieval. It's asking, requesting for information, making it very pointed and specific information, but using the silence as a way to amplify and build the intensity and the stress in the interview situation, rather than needing to use an intense form of confrontation. So the interviewer is able to use the pacing and also the silence in the room rather than needing to modify their behavior to be more aggressive or confrontational. And we certainly see that slowly through layering the evidence that the case is built, it becomes harder for Russell to dispute this evidence. Now, the interviewer also allows Russell to be the person that is deciding the outcome rather than directing or forcing a confession out of him. So it's really around creating the scenario and playing the role of wanting to help Russell get to the outcome. And in the end, it is through the empathizing and identifying with Russell that Ultimately, they're able to shift the dialogue to open up the conversation then about the offending. And then we see this is all finally brought together through the summarising of the discussion around the offending at the end. Um, as you might expect here, Russ, uh, certainly uh, even now, one of the uh, Ottawa investigators mentioned to me that um, there's a number of incidents that... Uh, that have gone unsolved over the years. <coughs> can I, uh, I was going to get into that, can I go to the washroom quickly? Yeah, I can get somebody to take you to the washroom, okay. So that's an example of a brief summary of the detective bringing together what's recently been discussed and then trying to then use that summary to fuel and drive additional aspects of the interview. Now, we don't have the closure and evaluation aspects of this interview, but ultimately, Williams did confess to committing the two murders and many other crimes. Now, in looking at his offending, he first committed his first offence on the 17th of September 2009 against a woman in her 20s who'd recently given birth. Now, he offended against the female when her boyfriend was out of town and she was at home alone with her child. So he broke into the home through a window by cutting the fly screen and the victim awoke to him pressing down upon her, at which time a struggle ensued and he continued to hold her down for a period of roughly 30 minutes. Then a conversation took place in which he told her that he didn't plan to kill her, instead to take pictures of her. And with his hands, he struck the woman three times in the head and threatened her into submission. He then blindfolded her with a pillowcase, tied her up, posed her and took pictures of her for approximately two hours before leaving. And he also took her underwear or pairs of her underwear as he left. Then 13 days later, he committed his second sexual assault, targeted a sleeping woman who was again home alone. Instead of waking the victim with a verbal warning as he did previously, he jumped on top of the sleeping woman, placing a blanket over her head, beating her repeatedly and warning her not to look at him. As with the first victim, he blindfolded her and proceeded to take photos of her for approximately three hours, forcing her to display herself in various sexual poses, and then he eventually left. Now, although both crimes are sexual assaults, no penetration occurred in these initial crimes. Instead, he forced the victims to pose in various stages of undress while taking pictures of them, which is likely to be in an attempt to procure more deviant and fetish type of material, which was really fueling that behavior at that time. He did uh, assault the women through touching their breasts, but no further assaultish ensued. And probably when the second victim protested, 
there was certainly the evidence of sexual violence that it came through him attacking her. And in both cases, he entered the victim's home in a surprise or blitz type of attack to gain control. But of course, this was all just the tip of the iceberg and Russell had been offending really over a two-year period where he'd been perpetrating break and enter offences and it totaled to 82 different counts of break and enter where he was stealing underwear, taking photographs of the victims and masturbating in their clothing and this progressed to taking information about the victims and then masturbating in their home through to the sexual assaults and then ultimately towards the end it then progressed to the two counts of murder. So that is the case of Colonel Russell Williams and the interview really provided a strong and precise indication of how a police interview should be conducted and it really highlighted as well the use of the psychological strategies and the use of the piece model and the structured eyes process to conducting an interview and it really does model as a good template and good guide of how an effective interview interview should be conducted.